Welcome, Drink with James, episode 148. We were gone last week. We're back again with a very special grace. Grace, Jesus, I did it again. <laughs> we, you know what? We are back with a very special grace. Grace Atwood, <laughs> a special grace. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Thank so happy to be here. for coming. Grace, we've known each other for how many years? A long time. A long time. Yeah, um, really it's best time. not to ask a, yeah. um, a person over 35 anything, yeah. um, which I am now. It was my birthday, if you guys missed it. Um, a, just, we're about to get to the good stuff, but a real quick note. I got a lot less whiskey sent to me for my birthday than I would have expected to get. So feel free to uh, send it over. 72 Allen Street, third floor, New York, New York, 10002. Uh, accepting all types of brown liquid uh, to the office now. But what's so, your favorite? I mean, like give some, give some specifics. You don't no, want to be let down. I don't, I can't be let down by a bottle of whiskey. That's what is so great about whiskey. <laughs> Why it's better than people, um, because I don't get let down by bottles of whiskey. I think okay. it's all great, and it's great in its its uh, variety. I'm someone that like I like to have like, you know, at home I have like ten open bottles. Oh wow! That, all like, of whiskey? Yeah, that it'll take like months to get through. Okay. But like you're not, I'm, I'm not like a creature of habit in that way that I'm like drinking the same stuff all the time. Okay. So send me something that you love. Uh, as long as it's not like under twenty dollars and coming. That's what in. I was gonna say. Yeah. I'm gonna send you a fifteen dollar yeah, bottle no. to say thank you. If it's in plastic, I don't want it. That's my that's my rule. <laughs> that's my that's my thing. It's got to be in a glass bottle. So, um, but Grace is. Yeah, let's get back to the show. Um, Grace is is uh, you know has been doing this for as long as this has been a thing really, um, and has, in some ways, changed a lot with the time. Some ways hasn't. We usually do these intros after, we're doing it before, so I don't know what this conversation is going to hold, but it is going to be great, I'm sure. So welcome again, and let's start with the, with the easy one, which is just like, how did you, how'd you get into this world? So I started my blog in January of 2010, um, which feels like ages ago. At the time I was working in the beauty industry, I was really unhappy. I had, um, so I always tell this story, I had this boss that, um, I was a marketing manager, so I had people under me, I wasn't like brand new. But she would make me, she thought I didn't know enough about color. So she gave me 200 bottles of pale pink nail polish all around the like SE Ballet slippers level uh -huh. and had me Velcro them in order of color. Oh, wow. So those were like things I was doing at like 9 p.m. <laughs> on a Tuesday night. And I was just so she, So she thought you like literally didn't know much about colors. Color. Okay. Like, like color. And I, I can now like look at a pale pink nail polish and be like, don't look at my nails. They're terrible today. I can be like, that's ballet slippers, that's Mademoiselle, that's okay. this. Um, no. But it was it was a really nightmare job. She was very scary. I would go home and cry a lot. So I started this blog as just like a fun thing to kind of just share things I liked and ultimately built this community mostly on Twitter at the time hmm. because that was where everyone was conversing and I was suddenly like kind of like striking up friends with beauty editors and things because you know you start tweeting back and forth with people. So did you start with beauty um, it was a mix it was mostly actually I did beauty but it was actually mostly fashion DIYs so mm. my, the way that I kind of like I guess made a name for myself in the industry was I would see like a $600 Danny Joe necklace and I mean I was on a budget so I would, could not spend $600 on a necklace I mean I still wouldn't spend that on costume jewelry like yeah um, and I would figure out how to make it for you know $50 Oh, Serena from Gossip Girl, this was so long ago, was wearing this $600 Danny Joe necklace, but here's how you can make it for you know $60. Mm. So I was really always into making jewelry when I was younger. I don't do it enough anymore, but yeah. um, that was kind of how I got like noticed, I would say. Okay. It's funny because when you were like, I wouldn't spend that on... First, I thought you were going to say jewelry. I'm like, you do have a Rolex on. I do, so that's, but that's different. That's, <laughs> that is fine jewelry. Fine jewelry is fine. That it, is an investment, yes, James. Absolutely. But I know. It, it, I was just, yes. Yeah. For a glass jewelry. bead necklace, no, no. So did you have a, you know, in the beginning, obviously, 2011, no one's making money. This isn't a thing. You're just doing it because your job kind of sucks and yeah. you want an outlet, right? Yeah, I just wanted to share. Yeah. Like, I just wanted a place, like, I have always loved writing. So it was kind of just like my little place that I had. And then as it got noticed, like it became more for just like getting noticed. 
The first partnership I ever had was, I think, two years into it, and UGG okay. had me judge a boot competition where they were having all this user-generated user content where people could upload pictures of the boot that they had decorated, and wow. I, would, I was a judge. What a hellscape. Yeah, so yeah. I filmed a video, I did a blog post, I don't think there was Instagram yet, and I judged a competition, and okay. I got no, $300, and I bought new all of our people's sunglasses. <laughs> so then it was like, oh, maybe this could help like fund my shopping habit. Right. Like this is great. And then it started to like slowly make more money. Yeah. So <laughs> in, that, in that first two years, you are just mostly focusing blog and Twitter? Yeah. And, and how... And I think I made a Facebook page for it too. Okay. Yeah. And like how often are you, like how seriously are you taking this? It's, it's, it's hard to to yeah. pump out five blog posts a week and have a full-time job. Were you doing that? Like what? I posted it every, every Monday through Friday. I can't do something and not take it seriously. Like if I'm doing it, like I want it to be good. And it, even though it was mostly just for me, I was like, well, you know, I read Cupcakes and Cashmere and I read The Budget Babe. I'm like, well, they're publishing every day, so I must publish every day. Yeah. It wasn't like a, there was no strategy behind it. It was just like, well, this is what blogs do, so I'm going to do this. And what um, did you have? Okay, so you had your first sponsored post, and that was a moment when you're like, "Oh, this could maybe give me a little side cash to yeah. to be able to buy some nice nice things." But did you have a moment when it felt like it could be more than that? It could be more than just a thing that helped you shop. Yeah. Well, I think the first moment was that I got my next day job. I got out of out of the beauty job, and I. Um, got a job in social media working for Bottle Bar. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is my resume. So like not even thinking about making a living from it, I was like, this is something I can show jobs and be like, I built this, like yeah. this is my site that I did. And then I think it was probably after two years at Bottle Bar, I got to a point where I was making about the same as my, as my day job. And then yeah. I started to make more and I was like, oh, like this has potential. Yeah. But I was always so nervous because I think this industry is so volatile that I was like, well, this is great for now, but like... Right, who knows? Who knows about next year? Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, it's so interesting that, I mean, by the time you quit your job, or when you were making more money at, at, at Bobble Bar than, or at, on the blog than at your job, um, how long into having the blog was that? Okay, like, I have to do backwards math. So it was, I started my blog nine years ago, I had quit four years ago, so it was. So you're five years in. Yeah, five years in, That's and I a would long say time. it was like four year, three or four years in that I was making close okay. to my, to, yeah. So you're five year, you're four years in, and then it starts to feel like, oh, yeah. this could be, this could be a thing. Yeah. Um, what I mean, I think most people would feel that before making more money than their <laughs> salary. Um, so was it that you were feeling? that you were feeling that like discomfort with taking the jump or that it was such a new industry and you just weren't sure? It was such a new industry and to be totally honest, I, w I really ha felt like there was like a stigma around being a full-time blogger. I just, I now it's like the goal and people understand what we do, but I dealt with a lot of criticism from people I knew and you know, like why are you taking your selfie every day? Why are you um, posting your outfits like do you think you're just like so pretty or you know what I mean like mm -hmm. things like that and I was like no I'm just sharing like with the world and like I also thought at the time like there was such a market for you know like somebody who's not a size zero but not a plus size like just some a regular girl sharing her outfits yeah so I was really nervous about like what other people would think and also would I be able to get another job afterwards mm -hmm. like it felt to me like almost like a mom just leaving the industry and then trying to go back in five or ten years, yeah. would that be me? Yeah. So I was just really, I was very apprehensive. And it was such a different time. People weren't leaving their jobs. Yeah, no one at took it speed. seriously. Yeah, there wasn't as much money, obviously, and it just wasn't. Yeah. I mean, at the time, were was a lot of your money coming from sponsored posts, or was it like back in the ad revenue days it was, on like banner ads and stuff? Banner ads, like, I... I did okay on those in the early, early days, but then the CPMs just dropped so yeah. much. It was affiliate marketing and um, sponsored posts. Yeah. And it was for me when the affiliate grew because that is something that is always consistent and something you can control a little bit more. Whereas you, like, 
brand, brand partnerships, you don't know. Like one day you're gonna have like 20 great offers in a month and you have to turn work down. Yeah. Another month you might only get two and it's just very, it's not consistent. I think most influencers who are starting out now or in the last couple of years aren't actively creating blogs, one. Yeah. And they're not trying to turn their site into a shopping destination. But I think it's such a powerful thing yeah. to have built that. Um, did you, you know, was that a thing that, you know, as you took it more seriously, that was a strategy? Were you like, I want this to be a place where women, girls can come and shop? Or was it just that was what you were interested in and it kind of grew? I think it was more what I was interested in. I was always nervous because there's a lot of blogs that are really affiliate focused and it just feels like they're shoving stuff down your throat and it's like there's no soul. And mm -hmm. so I always wanted to have it be more of a place where I could connect with my, my audience. But I also, of course, like I'm, I love to shop. So I wanted to share that those discoveries and things. Like I grew up reading, or not grew up, but in college I read Lucky Magazine and I was like, always into sharing these fun discoveries with my friends. Mm -hmm. So I think it was more um, just about sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And Less about strategy, which <laughs> now I'm more strategic, but. I mean, I think that like, this is a common story in, I think the, the, the kind of influencers that started as bloggers and started back when you did or, or before is that a lot of this stuff did just kind of evolve. Yeah. And it wasn't, super strategic because there wasn't a lot of money in it so it was just like yeah a thing you were you were it's doing like a fun hobby yeah yeah how, how did you you know was it hard to leave your job i mean obviously you were pretty secure because you were making more money but as you said you know even when i had raised money for this business and and had to quit my job a job that i didn't love but i was nervous because it's like you're jumping out of a stream a stream that like, you know, growing up you're like, I'm going to work, I'm going to be in corporate America, I'm going to have a job and I'm going to yeah. get a better job and then a better job yeah. and a better job. And so like jumping out of that into your own thing is scary because it's, you're basically saying potentially goodbye to that yeah. version of your life. And no matter whether you love it or not, it is still a, a big step. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So did you... Yeah, did you, you struggle? You obviously struggled a bit with that because you waited a year. Yeah. Well, I cried and then I tried to. Um, <laughs> this is a theme so far. I cried <laughs> and then I tried to um, consult. So I got them to, because what happened really was I got to a point where I wasn't doing either well. Like I wasn't thrilled about the content I was putting up. My outfit post, I always had to wear sunglasses because I looked so damn tired because I was not sleeping. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I was. A shitty employee. Are we allowed to swear? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I was a shitty employee <laughs> and I was not doing my best with the blog. Yeah. So I got to a point, I remember, I still remember I had a launch party because I rebranded from an embarrassing name of Stripes and Sequins uh -huh. to the Stripe. And I had. Nice a, pivot. Yes. Much nice better pivot. pivot. Nice pivot. <laughs> and then I had a. Um, a big party for it for the rebrand like my friends in PR so she helped me throw this like giant party in Brooklyn and it was so much fun but that weekend I couldn't get out of bed yeah and I was like I just I wasn't sick I just was so tired that my whole body felt like lead and I was like something has to happen here mm -hmm. so I talked to my boss at Bobble Bar and I was like this I'm like falling apart and she was like well how about you just do only the influencer stuff and not the social media stuff two days a week but the, the problem is, is that, and that I think every company realizes this now, you need a dedicated person on influencer, yeah. like especially a company of that size, yeah. because it's so many relationships, so many emails. So then these girls would email me on days where I was off and I couldn't just not respond to them for two mm -hmm. days. So it was just really hard to balance that. And then I ultimately left, I think after like four or five months of the consulting thing. And then it was, I felt like I was fully ready. Yeah. Do you, I mean, this is, this is just a random question but like do you miss being in an office like do you miss that interaction I think something I would struggle with working from home is the yeah. lack of like human interaction yeah you know so I try and get out like whether it's something like this or a meeting or an event at night I have an intern who's with me two days a week and that's really helpful just to just have someone there and then Actually, since launching the podcast, I now have a coworker in Becca who I do the podcast mm -hmm. with. So we're talking all day and we're brainstorming, and that's brought some of that collaborative feeling back. But I miss like 
every day getting up and needing to look cute and going into an office and gossiping about Game of Thrones and like everything that happened that weekend. Yeah. Um, I do. I do really miss that. Yeah. All my all my best friends were at Bolivar, but then we all left. Right. So it changed. Yeah. I think I would I would struggle with that. Like you know, just the yeah, just even being around people. I think if you're yeah. social, it's such a yeah. I think a lot of people think, oh, this is going to be so great. I'm going to work for myself and, yeah. and like no boss. But yeah. then you're like your third day sitting in your apartment answering emails in your pajamas. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm going like yeah. this. I'm going to go fucking crazy. Yeah. So I make sure I get dressed every day. <laughs> I make sure that I have some sort of a plan. And sometimes I don't want to have a plan like. That like this week after like your party and like all the other things, I was like, I just need to chill. Yeah. And that's when it's really great to be like, it's gonna be a work on the couch day. Like, yeah. I never work on my couch. I like to have separation between like my office area, yeah. but it was a couch day on Monday. What's been your biggest? What's been the biggest surprise for you, um, or the biggest challenge of of kind of doing this thing on your own that maybe that you didn't expect? Because I think a lot of people watching are probably hoping to, to do what you did yeah. and quit their jobs and do this full time. And, and so what, what do you wish you knew when you quit that you know now? Make sure you factor in paying for health insurance when you, um, cause you have to be making more from your, when you're self-employed than you do from your day job. I was like, oh, I'll be fine. And I, I am fine, but I was like, wasn't counting on paying seven or $800 a month for health insurance. Yes. Um, and just budget and save and, I was, and, and also have confidence in yourself. I didn't have any sponsored posts the month I quit my job. Oh my gosh. And I was like, fuck, what have <laughs> I done? And then it was fine. The next month I had like double what yeah. I usually get. But just, you know, if, you're, if you do something, have confidence and save your money so that you're, you have a cushion and you can always, the other thing is you can always get another job. Yeah. Like you can, if you're smart and you work hard, you can always get another job. I think it's true. I mean, I think that like, there's this feeling that if you go try something um, and it fails, what will happen? Like any employer, especially now, if you went and started a business or tried to you know, yeah. do the influencer thing uh, full time and it didn't work out, I, I think that would only be seen as a positive. Yeah, you know, it shows, shows you, you take initiative risks. and yeah. you take risks. And, yeah. Um, again, I didn't expect to, to talk so much about you know, what it's like doing this full time and, and, and you know, not fully on your own. You're managed, correct? Yes. 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 So not fully on yeah. your own, but like. Yeah. Um, but what you know, I think one of the things you lose when you lose a boss is at least like forced accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can slip a little. Yeah. And certain things, right? And, and so, I guess two part question: One, were you the kind of person that always? didn't really struggle with goal setting and holding yourself to, accountable to your own standards? And how do you continue to strive and to hit your goals and to push yourself beyond what you think you're potentially capable of? So I've always just been like a little bit of a workaholic, um, which I think you have to be in order to do what we do. But um, so, you know, the problem is like getting myself to like shut off because when you're in an office you can just leave yeah. when you're at home you're like well I don't have plans like I can get ahead on my blog content and maybe I'll write an extra post and like maybe I'll just do all these emails at 10 yeah. p.m. and then you're just burnt out so I think it's really important to set boundaries in terms of goals like I have a big excel spreadsheet and every month I have traffic goals follower growth goals um you know podcast download reviews goals all of those mm -hmm. so I just like keep myself really on track, but I think that's my personality type, yeah. so I don't know if that's helpful advice. I mean, I, th I think it can be. Uh, you know, I'm also interested in like, how do you, you know, how do you separate, I think that like, when you're doing so much by yourself, um, there is always something to do, right? Yeah. And just because there is something to do, doesn't mean that you should do it. Specifically, I'm... you should do it. Yes. Like, you know, someone should do it. Yes. But how do you know when to start, you know, when not to hide. I think, it, here's the thing, I think you can hide in the like minutia of busy work, which is yeah. emails and doing things yeah. like that and be like, well, I was very busy today and I got all these emails done and I got all this stuff done where maybe you aren't focusing on the bigger things that you should be. Should you have been out having 10 meetings with 
brands no. instead, you know, yeah. instead yeah. of answering, you know, reader emails. I mean, maybe, maybe not, maybe you should be at home answering reader emails, but how do you prioritize those things, especially as the business grows? You're an ambitious woman, you want yeah. more than what you have, so like, how do you, how do you balance that? I really struggle because I want everything to be in my own voice. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, last summer was wonderful because I had an intern who was answering all my DMs for me. And then I just felt bad about that because it wasn't, my readers thought they were having this amazing connection with me and it wasn't me. Yeah. So I stopped doing that and now I, I answer every message. And maybe it's just like I feel this like obligation to my readers. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been successful is that my readers feel like we're friends. And because of that, I prioritize that probably over meeting with brands. Mm -hmm. But I'm also lucky and I've been doing it for so long that I have this big network and I don't have to take a lot of meetings. Yeah. I would like to take more. But, um, and I don't really go, go to that much stuff right. anymore. But I think I need to, I think it's finding like the smaller tasks, like cropping images. Um, I always do all my photography through a photographer because uh -huh. that's just not something I'm particularly strong at. Um, what else? I don't outsource a lot and I should. Having a manager has really helped just because I don't like talking about money and I'm so friendly with so many people in the industry that I'll be like, oh, I'll just do it for free. Yeah. And I, I still do that sometimes. Yeah. Or I'll just do it for like half. Not for us, um. just to be clear. <laughs> She's never said that for us, but awesome. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yeah. Um. We have it all naked now, so. <laughs> That's why I have a manager. So she has really, really helped with that. And she also keeps me organized and like, there, there was last month we just had so many different think deadlines and every day it was like yeah. like someone kind of like lighting a fire under right. your tail. So that has helped. I also find having a manager helps you kind of be like the shiny talent. Yeah. Um, so you can be the fun one. You've talked about this on yeah. previous episodes. Like I love the relationship. Like I want to like come to four and you know drink with you guys and like hang out, but I don't want to be the one talking about money too. Yeah. So I find that that has, has helped me a lot. Photography is a big one. I have an SEO person helping me, so she mm. comes up with a lot of outsourcing content ideas and things that are trending on the internet. Yeah. Um, and she also optimizes all my posts, which has been, That's I've seen true. a lot of growth yeah. from that. Yeah. You know, I think that like an existential question that any founder, any business owner has to ask themselves is like, how big do I want this to be? Yeah. And can it scale, right? Like you can't, if you want, you know, the stripe to be as big as man repeller, you can't be answering DMs, I know. right? Like that's not a re reality. Yeah. But every business doesn't have to grow to yeah. the absolute biggest it can be, right? Like sometimes it's nice to keep something, you know, you might be at a size where you're like, this feels great, I love it, and I'm happy, and I live a good life, and I make good money, and, and I have more brands that want to work with me than I can work with, so I can just start charging more of a premium. Like for you, Again, as someone I know is ambitious, what, you know, what is it? Do you, do you want it to be much, much bigger? So yes and no. I want my podcast and my blog to keep growing. Um, Instagram, I'm fine if I stay at that number. Uh -huh. And that'll always be hard because brands measure you on your Instagram following. But at the same time, like, I really like, and it's funny because my Instagram has grown. It started to grow again once I was like, oh, I don't care if it grows. <laughs> it's like, that's just how it, how mm -hmm. it is. But it's, it's truly not a huge focus for me. Like, I will always be on there and engaging and doing all of the things. But I see someone like a cup of Joe, for example. And maybe she's a bad example because she's one of the original bloggers. Yeah. But, you know, anytime, like, she linked to a photo of mine, just the photo credit, because she borrowed an image. And that drew like 300 clicks to my site. And I was yeah. like, I want that. Like, I want this massive website that people come to and, and I don't know if that's realistic in this world, but my tra traffic's been up like 30% every year. So I think yeah. it, it can get there. Um, I want a massive website. I want my podcast to, you know, we set the goal of by 29th, sorry, 2020 in the, in the year to quintuple our traffic. And mm -hmm. our traffic's already three times what it was at the start of the year. Mm -hmm. So growing that, um, I want to have more live shows for my podcast. Instagram, like if it grows, great if it doesn't like 
I have enough of a hard time replying to all those DMs. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if that's like a, a proper strategy, but I think that we all have to do like the things that we enjoy the most, like the blog and the podcast. Like I just love both of them so much yeah. and I am seeing great growth with those. Instagram, it's like this big rat race and this big competition and they change the algorithm every day and yeah. everyone's upset because their numbers are going down. And I think, why, why are we killing ourselves in something that's constantly changing? Yeah. And again, it's an important part of the business. Like I have sponsored campaigns with you guys and yeah. I always want to do a great job with those. But if I keep my Instagram rates the same as they've always been and I keep maybe growing that in a small way, that's fine to me. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty rare statement I know. on this show. I, think, I, I don't want to give I'm, bad advice. Like, I'm not a great photographer. Yeah. And I just know that you are such a good photographer. Thank you. Um, and I outsource that. But, you know, at the time, right now, iPhone images are just performing so much better mm -hmm. on Instagram. And, like, that's great for me. But I also don't really have a lot of people I can just ask to take a photo. Like, right. if I'm out with my friends at night, I don't want to be like, oh, will you just, like, snap my outfit? Like, right. So I find, you know, having an intern to do that is really helpful. But also, like, Instagram is a photo-heavy platform. So right. it's not going to be my strongest one. I think I'm much stronger on stories because I'm just talking and and yakking about like what I think is cool and right. not really, again, not really caring. <laughs> Did you struggle with that decision? I mean, you sound so confident and like okay with that now. It but wasn't you until must the podcast. Have, yeah, you must, yeah. it must have been tough to see, oh, yeah. you know, you're in this, it, being in this world is strange because other influencers are your friends and your colleagues, but they're also your competitors, yeah. you know, in there, and you judge yourself against them and, and unfortunately, you don't walk around with a sign above your head that shows how much traffic you have, yeah, yeah. which it's, is an it's, impressive number. Um, and so it must have been hard to see people, you know, fly by you on Instagram. It did you, is. Did you struggle with that? And I struggled also with not getting angry because I'm not a per I'm pretty like calm. And all the, it was the loop giveaways. Like I don't think that people are doing those as much anymore. Yeah. But those goddamn giveaways, like I just like have no patience for them. And I think it's a terrible way to build your business. And I saw so many people just flying by me and getting partnerships that I would have loved to get. But I also keep in mind whenever I work with a brand, I'm like, listen, like I don't do any of that. And like the people that you are seeing liking it, they're real. So at the end of the day, I, I can sleep at night and I don't feel bad. But again, then there's people who are, who are just so talented. Like I think of like, Whenever I go to JC Dupree's feed, it's just like so put together, but it also feels very in the moment mm -hmm. and like never staged. Um, I think Kat Sunita's photography on her site is so beautiful. There's so many influencers that are doing such a great job. Yeah. But I think that we're all just strong in different ways, and I think that it's so important to focus on what you're good at and not get down. But I will say I was not this confident until I watched the podcast. Um, like when we we sold out. Caroline's mm -hmm. um, and we were so terrified we we're like you want like us to do a live show they're like yeah if you can get 60 people in the room like that's fine yeah and we're like we have 60 friends we can force them all to yeah. like buy a $20 ticket and, yeah, come. Yeah. and we sold it out and it's like incredible. that was the best one of the best nights of my life so you know if my Instagram isn't growing as much as like some some people's right. well, no one's growing right now are people growing like so, talk I mean to me. Tezza. Tezza. Tezza is Tezza is doing a great yeah. job Tezza probably got 10,000 followers since this show started recording. <laughs> <laughs> but like great, like great for her. Yeah. Um, but I also, I see the other thing that I see on these, a lot of these Instagrammers, like they're always going to new destinations and taking these beautiful photos. And when I travel, like I want to be in my Birkenstocks and like, I am like cutoffs and like, I do a lot when I travel. I'm an aggressive traveler, but I don't yeah. want to be camera ready the whole time. Yeah. So I see that and I'm like, like that's great. Like or Julia from Galmates Glam, like yeah. she does such a beautiful job. Yeah, they're amazing. But I don't I don't want that. Like yeah. I know what the behind the scenes looks like. Right. And it's so much work. And anyone it's this is mostly influencers, right? Yeah. And, like, I get, and my mom. Uh, hi James's mom. <laughs> I get really upset when people are like, Oh, they're complaining about all their travel. I'm like, that's not a vacation. Like they're they're creating this dream world yeah. and they're working so hard the whole time. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah, um, it yeah it is it is it is full on. But but I think just to push once more, like did you feel, I'd say what like a couple years ago, yeah, like that you had like missed 
the boat on it that you yes. had like fucked up. I felt like I fucked up. In focusing too much on blog and not jumping to like, Instagram. Well, I, I fucked up in so many ways and I still think I fucked up because I used Instagram. Well, first I used it as, I used, <laughs> this is so bad. I used it because I thought it was like a filtering service yeah. for images. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of what it was in the beginning. Yeah, and for the first year I was on Instagram, I was just using it as a filter and pushing it to Twitter. Yeah. And then I remember one day I looked in there and I was the director of social media for a company when I did this, so <laughs> bad, bad, bad. <laughs> I looked in there and I was like, oh, I've got like 10,000 followers on here. Cool. And then I realized that was something I needed to focus on. Yeah. But still, I would take, I would take a, you can't even do this on stories anymore. I would take a picture of my blog post on my computer and put it on Instagram and be like, new post. Oh, wow, yeah. Like I wasn't even that's like downloading really, the photo really and putting that up. Grace. What? That's really innovative. That's nice. It was real <laughs> bad. Like it was, so I, Miss, I missed the boat and I could have grown very quickly if I had just yeah. paid more attention. And I remember because a lot of my blogger girlfriends and I had some more followings, like this was years and years ago, like JC and Kat and a few others, like we were all like, I don't know, maybe like 30,000 followers and like they went like this and I went like this. Yeah. But you can't beat yourself up because I, at the end of the day, I'm so proud of everything I'm doing right now. And I, it wasn't my full-time job at the time. Yeah. And I just, I, I made some big oversights with Instagram. Yeah. But it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good lesson because like. It's a huge lesson. Even if you had focused on it to your point now, you probably wouldn't have been that good at it. Right? Like, because yeah. at it's the photography time. photography app. Yeah. At the time, you know, Instagram has gone through so many different iterations of like what is popular and what is like on trend and like yeah. you doing super minimalist photos against the white wall with you yeah. like really small. I just don't see that being like your It wasn't your it's not thing. my vibe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me trying um, would probably have been like me and like twenty five colored items like, yes. <laughs> with like and being like a big smile and it, right. maybe it would have worked but probably not. <laughs> probably not. Yeah, probably not. Um, yeah. But so then, okay, so then you, you know, you wallow in self-pity for a little while and then you get back to work and, and how do you, how do you think about starting a podcast? So that was, it started as, so I'm always now because of Instagram, like watching what's growing and what's, what, where things are going. And I was like, I need a podcast. I was like, I just, I need a podcast. At the same time, I never want to do something just because it's like the cool thing to do. And I never want to do something and not have it be done well. Mm -hmm. So I was like me talking or trying to interview a different guest every week or talking to, into a recorder every week would be boring as hell. So I asked my friend Becca to do it and I knew I wanted it to be about books, which is what we kind of started it as because yeah. my reading lists on my website are oddly like one of the most trafficked posts every month because people mm -hmm. want book recommendations. Yeah. So like it's going to be a book club and that's how yeah. we started it. And there was so much learning involved, like a lot of just searching YouTube tutorials to figure out how to like, we, at one point we had the sound going in one ear and then the other one and like there were, there's just been so many technical yeah. difficulties. So a lot of just like looking up different tutorials and teaching ourselves stuff. But it was, it just started with the book thing and then yeah. it kind of took on its own life from there. Did you think going into it, did you feel like it was something that you were going to be good at? Mm -mm. No? No. It's always been about my blog because I do think I'm really good at my blog. Um, I was like, this is another marketing tool to get people to my blog. They'll find me in iTunes and then they'll go to my blog. Yeah. And that has happened. But similar to the way Instagram is, there's just this whole audience of people that want to find new podcasts and consume that right now. Yeah. Um, and when did you know that it felt like there was something interesting happening with the podcast that like maybe, like, oh shit, this could be like a thing in its own right? Well, the live show was a big one because of that. I would say, I think when we started to take on guests, we saw our numbers go up uh -huh. so much because those interviews were really interesting and fun. And I would also say with our Facebook group, that's like, there's only 2,000 women in it, but it is like the most busy little thing. Like mm -hmm. everyone's sharing book recommendations and like it's just this amazing community and those people are so engaged and yeah, I think that I would say that because then it was like, well, when are you doing more live shows? And we were like, we didn't even plan to sell one out. Like, yeah. so now we're doing five. And Amazing. I think 
you know, podcasting is really interesting because it's much more regulated than blogging. Like it's all on a CPM basis. So we don't charge much for our ads still, even for like a pretty successful podcast. Like yeah. for what I charge for an Instagram post versus a podcast ad is so different, yeah. which I understand, but I also think it's interesting because people are captive for that one hour yeah. and they're like really listening and paying attention. So I wasn't, I never thought it was gonna be very lucrative, but I think as it grows and as um, the, we do more live shows, it, we, we like just incorporated and now we're like starting to see, we still haven't paid ourselves for the podcast yeah. though yet. Yeah. <laughs> so How long have you been doing it? Things might look successful yeah. on the outside, but they're in a year. Okay, yeah. a year. Yeah. Um, and, and when did it like, when did it shift in focus because I think, again, it started yeah. as like a thing with specifically young adult books, right? Yeah. Um, so, well, we got tired. Yeah. We were trying to do, well, first I was like, we'll read one book a week because I do read a book a week. Yeah. But when you're doing a podcast, you also have to outline it and come up with talking points and discussion. Are you supposed to do that? Because I've never done that for this <laughs> show. I think that's probably why. Yeah, that yeah it's probably it's why hard. you have more people listening to yours. No, it's hard to remember all of the things that you're gonna talk about with a book at least. Like right. when we do interviews with people, it's much more informal. Yeah. But we quickly quickly realized we we're definitely not doing one book a week. Yeah. So then we were like, let's do two books a week. And I just found, found myself so tired and it started to take a lot of the pleasure out of reading because we were like scrambling to read these books. Like, it, like I remember there was one Monday and we had to record that day and I couldn't do any of my regular work because I had to read this book. <laughs> and I was like, this is miserable. Yeah. So then we switched down to one um, one book a month and that okay. was a much better model. But we took November, most of November, we took from Black Friday through Christmas off because I was so burnt out for the blog and I was like, I can't, yeah. like, I can't focus on this. It's not making any money. It's kind of a pain in the ass. And I was right. like, we'll see if we want to keep doing this. And I, I only kept doing it because Becca loved it so much. Yep. And I was like, I'm not going to keep doing this. And but I don't want to let my friend down. Right. And now I love it. Like, I'm so glad I kept doing it. And you were saying it's, it's, it's actually started to drive some Instagram growth for you as well, yeah. right? I think, um, and it also just, I think I want to say like loyalty amongst current followers because I get a lot of messages being like, you know, I always liked your blog and I liked your writing and I liked your outfits or whatever they liked, your beauty reviews, but I really like you now. And I was like, thanks. Like, because I think when someone's listening to you for an hour and a half, they feel like they're your friend. Yeah. And so I think it's really helped I'm starting to see more engagement on my Instagram. I'm starting to not lose followers. I spent all of 2018 losing followers. Like I've heard worse stories. Like a friend of mine lost like 15,000 followers last year. I probably only lost like 2,000, but that's still super discouraging. It's really frustrating. Yeah. And you've said like most influencers over 100K are losing yeah. followers. So 60%. that made me feel better. Yeah, 60%. Yeah. So when but like how fucking annoying to work the whole year and lose 2,000 yeah. followers. Yeah, and I looked at it as, well, I still like made a lot of money off of this, so, right. but yeah, like to lose, like it's so, it's just so frustrating because for every sponsored post you're doing five posts that you're paying for photography or like paying for an outfit or whatever it is you're paying for. Yeah. And to lose, lose people, you're like, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> so as the podcast has grown, my Instagram has started to grow again and my, I think my audience just frankly likes me more. Yeah. I think they get my sense of humor. Also, it's helpful with sponsored content, oddly, because for example, I did a brand campaign with Hinge, and up till then, I had talked about Hinge constantly on the podcast. I'm like, it's the only dating app I'll use, and this is all true. Right. And then Hinge came to me, and I was like, we want to buy a sponsored Instagram. I had users applauding the fact that I got the sponsored post, which never happens. They're right. like, yeah, get it, girl. Like, we've heard you talk about this for so long, or, um, there's another one. Oh, anytime I would talk about body washes, people know I have like a cleanliness obsession. Okay. And I love shower gel. Like I have eight different shower gels wow. in my shower. So I talk about it and then like I, I had a body wash sponsor and That's people amazing. were like, yeah. What's the best body wash? If you could only have one, what would it be? Right now I would say, well, James, this is really hard. Can I have two? No, you can have one. Um, it would have to be Glossy Hey Body Hero. It's just, if you like orange blossom, it's the best one. Okay. Wow. What is, is that a scent? Yes. Okay. You know, you talk about how you were able to kind of, you know, step away from, from the rat race of Instagram and from yeah. kind of being as precious with it. And, and like, 
has that been really freeing for you in, with Instagram, just to be more, like to caring less about it working? Yeah. Has it allowed you to do more and, and, and feel a little more free with the content you're putting on there? Yeah, absolutely. Like I, it's, and it's so interesting also to test what does well. Like the night after of your party, I was out till 2 a.m. and my friend snapped this random black and white picture of me at the bar. I never would have posted that. Yeah. But I posted it the next morning with a terrible hangover, being like the best nights end in sequins and right. I don't know at 2 a.m. or something. And I, for me, it got like triple my usual right. engagement. People were probably just impressed that you were out till yeah. 2 a.m. on a school night, which yeah. was impressive. And I'm 37, folks, so still got it. Yeah. See, you <laughs> yeah. don't die at 35. No, life just begins. <laughs> um, you know, and I think the, the caveat here, you know, for, for people watching is that like, we talk about, you know, diversifying your income stream and, and, you know, when you, when Instagram is the only thing that you're making money off of. That's so scary. Then, yeah. And it, it, you have to really care about it. You yeah. have to be hyper focused on growth and engagement, but like you know, to have other things and have Instagram be a, a big and essential part of yeah. your revenue stream and the business that you have, I'm sure, um, but not be what in the startup world we call a single point of failure. You, know, you never want to have a business that if one thing changes, then you are ruined, right? Yes. So like, if you never got another sponsored Instagram post, you would still make a living doing this and you yeah. would still be successful and be fine. Yeah, and it would be harder, of course, yeah. but yeah. And I think, um, I don't know, I just always want to focus on what I can control. Besides the blog and the podcast, I'm really focused on my email newsletter because these are things that I own and no one's going to be able to mess with them. Yeah. And, and when you say focus on it, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? Making sure that every day there's a new blog post up, every Wednesday there's a podcast, every Friday but the, my newsletter. For the email newsletter oh, specifically. Just being really consistent with it, making sure that I put affiliate links in there to help drive extra revenue and keeping it interesting and something people want to open. So if, again, I'm an influencer and yeah. I'm like, I watch this or I listen to it and I'm feeling super inspired and I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm gonna, you know, either, let's say, they don't want to do a podcast, but they're like, I don't have a newsletter, I should. Like, yeah. what? How do you start? How do you make that interesting? Do you, is it all roundups? Is it, it, you know, is it different content for the newsletter? How do you, how do you kind of keep it interesting? Mine is generally um, a mix. Like I, whenever there's a really big sale, like the Nordstrom anniversary sale or Shop Up, I definitely do a sale roundup. But I try and keep it not too salesy. Um, someone I think does a great job with her email is Shanae Alexander. She does like an editor's letter, uh, an editor's letter. So I would say, like, think about what sets you apart and what you're really strong at um, and do that. Like, if your audience is really shopping focused, make it an extra shopping roundup. Um, Merritt Beck from The Style Scribe does a question and answer, and the only way to get the Q&A is th by subscribing mm -hmm. to her email. But I would just say it's a really good thing to start. And in terms of tactics, like, I do mine through MailChimp. Um, I think it's great if you have a blog to put the pop-up so it's the first thing they see, like stay in touch. People yeah. do like get this free thing if you sign up. I don't do that because I think mm -hmm. it's kind of cheesy. Um, put it in your, do swipe ups from Instagram yeah. stories, put it in your bio, like just tell everyone. And how often like on Instagram are you trying to push to that? Do you, do you say like, oh, once a week I'm going to do this or is it just kind of when you think about it? That's when I think, I, I just said that and I was like, I gotta do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good strategy that in theory I should do more. Yeah. But um, I think that if, you, if you're just starting it and it has to be more of a focus, like do that every, every week. Yeah. Don't be annoying. Yeah. But yeah, I just am always so hyper conscious, like am I being annoying to my followers? Like, which is why I don't do a lot of swipe ups in my stories. I, I always link to my blog posts like first thing in the morning, but you know how there's that constant like swipe of affiliate yeah. links and stuff like I don't want to see that like right. I think the best advice I can give any influencer is like do you want to see that like create things that you because that I didn't do that for a long time on my blog like in the early days yeah. like sometimes I would post something and I'd kind of totally cringe like now if it would look kind of bad or whatever and I would just be like well I gotta I gotta post right so try not to do that yeah I think we say a lot like, yeah, to, to, to ask yourself, we do this with clients as well, like, 
you know, what, think about the last thing that you swiped up on and why. Yeah. And like, try and understand what is driving you to swipe up on something and like, try and replicate that in the influencer work that you are doing. And so it is always good, I think, when you're thinking about your own content to be like, would I give a shit about this if it wasn't me? Yeah. Like, would I care about what I'm posting if it wasn't me? And if it's a no, it's probably not worth putting up there. Exactly. I totally agree. Wait, I want to go back to Instagram, though, because I don't <laughs> want people to think I totally don't care. Right. But I do care. It's yes. still my business. And I, I, if I have a post and it doesn't do well, I'm still, I still dig into the analytics and think about why it didn't do well. And I still care. Right. I just think you have a healthier I'm, I'm relationship a with it than you probably used to. And then yeah. A healthier relationship than a lot of influencers have with it. Yeah, it can get really. Which is to say, this is important, but this is not me. Yeah. And this is not my entire life. And getting your self worth out of it, like, this might sound emotional, but like, you can't measure yourself on that number. Yeah. It'll make you crazy. Yeah, no. It's like yeah. what you said the number floating above your head, because I want to be like, I wish that number could also include, like, blog traffic and right. podcast downloads and Facebook fans and like a whole picture, right. which you kind of do well with the, with the four profile because right. people can go on and see that your reach isn't just your Instagram or just your blog right. or just your Facebook. But it has had to have been tough over the last few years as a person's level of influence is, is essentially predicated almost solely on that number. Yeah. So people look at it and they're like, oh. Yeah. So you have like a you have a you're nice okay. following, yeah. yeah. But you're like, no, no, like I got all there's other a much stuff. bigger thing yeah. happening here. Yeah. The one thing that hurts is like with event invites often, because mm. like brands base their lists on Instagram audience, and I'd be like, like I'm at this also at this point in my life where I'd rather just be with my friends than at these brand events. But when you see all your friends at like a really cool party, and you're like, oh, I'm the only one that has, in that case, it was like under 100,000 followers. Right. And it just like hurts a little bit because yeah. you feel like you're getting left behind. Yeah, and this is your career and it is your life. And yeah. like you're allowed to be upset about those things. Of you course, know, I it's get, totally normal. I get jealous and pissed off and, and frustrated with myself when I see other people I know is businesses doing much better or yeah. getting, you know, amazing press coverage that we're not getting. And I'm like, what the fuck's wrong with me? So it, yeah. you know, I think a little pity party is okay every once in a while. Yeah. And it's so public. Like Jessica Sturdy has a podcast called, um, along for the ride. And she just did this great interview and she was like, imagine if at your job, like you could see every time a, um, a coworker who was getting promoted and you could see every time like someone was getting work and you weren't, and it's just right. so so public and so visible. Yeah, or like yeah. how much money people had or something, yeah. right? Like you yeah. can see what's in their bank account. Yeah. Be. In the in the twilight of our time together here. Yes. Um, I it's want to talk to about. An end. I want to stay it forever. It is coming to an end. Somehow. The new office is so nice. Thank everyone you. has to come here. Like not the everyone. bar. Everyone <laughs> just show up. <laughs> not everyone needs he to come. He gave you the address earlier. <laughs> Don't show up, um, unless you're bringing whiskey. Um, ooh. So, I want to talk about sponsored posts. Yes. Um, and, you know, how you, like, how you try and make those special, right? I think um, we've worked with you a bunch. You do a great job. Thank you. Um, what's, your, what's your process like when, when you've, you know, you've negotiated, all that's taken care of, right? Yeah. You've got the brief, like, where do you, where do you go from there? Well, I think the first thing is, is, like, would I want to read this? Like, we talked about just now. The second thing is, I always think like, it needs to, to, to be successful, it needs to be personal, or funny, or informative. It needs to be one of those three things. I have a fourth one and I totally forget what it is, but it needs to fall into one of those four categories, and it needs to be something I would want to engage with. So, and it needs to just be real. Like, I never want to work with a brand, like, so I'm part of the Sephora squad, which Four is doing. and. One of the things I love about it is that you really encourage us to be honest and forthright and share our, our actual opinions and not just like be regurgitating press releases. Right. Because if I'm expected to... As long as your opinion is positive. Yes, yes. But the great thing about that program is you pick us for things that we love. And like how, right. how can you go to Sephora and, find some, and not find something you like? Right. Like of course there might be individual products or lines right. that I'm not a fan of and then you just pass on those. Yeah. But it just has to be... It's a, the pressure is just definitely higher because if I'm getting paid, I, I have to make it something that my audience is really going to love. Yeah. So 
I'm just trying to think back. The, the latest post I did with you guys was the skincare one with Sephora. So A, I make, I make sure to work with a really good photographer so the imagery is really strong. Because again, I'm not great with photos. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing... And I think that, 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 that sounds like a small thing or an obvious thing, but like a lot of people don't do that. And I think that like when you get to Grace's level or hopefully beyond, um, although she'll be nipping at your heels, uh, and and what you're what we're paying you for a single post if we see photography that feels lazy it it's it's like what kind of fucking asshole do you think i am that yeah. you that you think it's okay for me to pay you thousands of dollars and for you to send me this shitty iphone photo back and be like well the problem is is the iphone photos do so well on instagram right, but it's like you have to be kidding me yeah you have to be kidding me that you think this is acceptable yes. this is not acceptable I agree. in any way i agree um, but i will say look, it gets better engagement again that's fine <laughs> but like you look like you look so unprofessional and you look like an asshole if you send a late like lazy imagery now if you really believe, and for you, iPhone imagery does better, talk to them before. Yes, yes. Say, iPhone imagery does better. Is that okay? I can hire a photographer, but like, yeah. you know. Also, just communicate with the brand. I recently had a book Instagram that I did, and they asked me three days before it had to go up if I could do it. And I said, I can do it, but it will be an iPhone photo. But I think that for this, like, iPhone photos do really well with my audience. Yeah. And the post did, it blew most of my sponsored content out really? of the water. Yeah, it was the Where'd You Go Bernadette one if yeah, you look yeah. at my page. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think, and it was creative, like I put the book up to my yeah. face and it was funny. But I think just be upfront with the brand and like communicate with them. Because I never would turn in an iPhone photo to a brand. I feel like, again, it feels really sloppy. Yeah. But if they ask you two days before something's due, you don't have an Instagram husband. I'm like still looking for one. I don't know where right. they all you are. You got to teach your cat. To <laughs> yeah, the cat needs to like, get button. better with the camera. Yeah. Um, but again, I didn't mean to derail you, but yeah. like, I do think that like, it's a small point to be like, oh, I make sure I yeah. hire a good photographer. But like, yeah. I, have, I, have, I have asked our team not to work with influencers because they've submitted iPhone photos. Yeah. And I'm just like, you must think I'm fucking stupid. Yes. Like, you must think I'm dumb mm -hmm. that I'm going to pay you for this. Uh, yeah. it's, it's frustrating. So, okay, so you get a great photographer. Uh, what's next? If it's a beauty post, this is something that you I know it bothers you. I make sure that I can try it for at least a week, at least ideally two weeks. So you I can this? really talk to the product benefits. Reader trust, it, fan trust, whatever you want to call it, is all we have as influencers. It's literally all we have. So if I give a shitty review of something, my audience is not going to trust me anymore. And that is going to impact my sales, my conversion, my traffic, mm -hmm. all of it. So. I have to, I've had to turn down a lot of work in the past month because I, things just have such tight tur turnarounds. Yeah. And I think that that is the most important thing. So you can give an actual like yeah. experience. I don't do a lot of fashion sponsored campaigns. Like every now and then I'll get one. There's not many of them. There's not as much. Yeah. If I do one, I make sure that it's really perfect. Again, get a great photographer. Yeah. I spent like two hours removing... Um, I don't know if this is relevant, but you know, in Photoshop, like there, I live in Brooklyn, so there's yeah. all these stickers on the wall, right. like removing and just like rats those. running around, right? I don't know. <laughs> no. Have been you ever been to Brooklyn? No, I've never been. I invited him to my house for a party, but he was sick. I was sick. See, I was <laughs> yes. lying. You'll come to the next one. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, there you, no were, rats. you were clone stamping stickers yes. out of a yes. thing. Yes. Yes. So I just make sure that it's like really perfect because I want, I want the brand to be happy, but I also want my readers to like it and like captions are a big one make it funny and interesting like for the skincare one I was like my bed and my skincare are my two greatest loves like yeah. and that's the truth right um so I'd say that but again it goes back to like would I like this on Instagram would I want to engage with this and if the answer is no go back to the drawing board and how do you you know I think that like it you know there are posts you know like when you start getting into mass CPG brands right brands yeah. that are make really great products that are part of yeah. so many people's lives but are harder to talk about yeah. you know because they're not body hero by glossier right yeah. like they're not, they're not exciting and cool. new and ha yeah mm -hmm. they're not cool um how do you like how do you approach those in it because you, you like you know you can't 
you know, it's like you want to make it about the product. Yes. But the product is is maybe beneficial or useful or good, but not inherently cool yes. or interesting. So how do you, do you I try and spice it up or are you just like, this is what's great about this? I generally, so I don't think I do the best job with this. It's something I'm still working on. I just will talk about what's genuinely great about it. Like I just did one for Nivea body wash and I talked about the fragrance because it's this cucumber melon fragrance and it really does make me, it transforms, it transports me back to my high school days where I had a cucumber melon body wash that I splashed on right. every day after track practice. Someone I think does an amazing job with that is not to, like totally fangirl her is JC. Mm -hmm. She does all of this content for Olay and she is making it cool the way that she photographs it. Like she has like this just a really great aesthetic and the, the way that she photographs these products does a great job. Yeah. If it's me, because I, again, my images aren't always, like, they're getting better, and I have a great photographer. Yeah. But I will make sure that I'm really selling the benefits and talking about the product in the caption. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, that's the advice we've given, is like, is that if you use the product and, and can, yeah. you know, I think something you said that's so true and so important is make it personal, right? Like, yeah. and if you don't use it, you can't don't make work it, with something you don't use. Yeah, you, well, you can't make it personal. Yeah. How could you? You don't under, You don't know anything about it. You don't mm -hmm. have a personal story about it. You know. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that like, you need to be. I, th I think making it personal is 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 such a, um, is such a great piece of simple advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you have pushed back with us on campaigns. Yeah. Um, because you felt like you didn't have time to. Yeah. To do that, and I think it's a really difficult and like kind of brave and, and smart It's hard because like do. there's all this money being offered to you but yeah. if if it's going to make my readers not trust me I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm going to just get like a bad feeling in my mouth like oh I, I it was like pretty packaging and it was a nice product but I don't even really know who, like right. how it works. Yeah. Or it's or it's like the brand's 10 things that they think are so great about it but you're just yeah. like regurgitating it as you said. Yeah. Um, okay so post is over. You yeah. posted, um, what, what do you do to like maintain relationships with brands? Um, and like, how are you managing that? Obviously you have your manager yeah. who's helping you presumably, certainly on inbound, but maybe uh, other ways as well. What are you doing right after the campaign? And well, what are you doing on an ongoing basis to stay top of mind? So there are two things that you told me to do. James will change your life, guys. See? Um, one is sending a performance recap. Um, I have not been as good as I was with sending those, but I always at least send the results as well as a thank you. Like, we loved working with you. I love the product. I'm still using it. From a less of a communications thing, I make sure that I keep integrating it into my post. So yeah. if someone sees my shower, they're going to see that Nivea body wash I'm still using, or yeah. they're going to see those Sephora products I just bought. So that they're still, and they're going to be featured in other ways on my blog, like in a product roundup or what have you, so that they're getting a little bit of, like I call it, like my backgrounds in marketing, like added value. Yeah. Um, and. Can I just jump in on that real quick? I know now we're both getting a little buzz, so we're like happily interrupting each other. Yeah. Um, I was in a meeting recently with a brand, great client of ours we love, and they were talking about how they paid this influencer all this money to use their coffee machine, and they did this great post that they were happy with, and they were brand was happy, you know, they felt good about it. And then a week later, they didn't do another post for a coffee company, but they were in their kitchen and, and their coffee machine was gone and it was replaced with another one. And they were really like, they were really upset about it. Of course, and they should be. Yeah, and like. And as a, re as, a, as a consumer of that person's content, I'd be upset. I'd be like, wait, you just talked about an espresso and now you're using Keurig? Like, I yeah. mean, I hope it's the other way around, but like. No, like, no, no, no. Right. And I, again, like, I think that, like, what influencers neglect to understand sometimes is, like, your actions have consequences. Yeah, and right? you have brands watching you at all times, and your readers are smart. Right. And I call like, them readers. I don't know what we call them in Instagram. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, Follower. Followers. Yeah. Uh, and, I call uh, my podcast listeners readers. And I, it's fine. No yeah. one's, nomenclature is not important. Yeah. Uh, so... Where, where was I going with this? Wait, wait, it was there. The it's coffee there. maker. The coffee maker, this. The brand was upset. I think you being like, 
I love, I'm very pleased that I didn't have to play at that point with you and you said that like you make sure to integrate it into your life because yes. like I can tell you this, every single brand's expectation is that if they pay you for a post that they will get more than that. Of course. In coverage. Of course. Like, and they should. It's, it's almost one for one. You know, like not a dedicated post that is like, again, talking about all the key benefits and stuff, yeah. but like having it be in there and throw a tag. I never understand this. And Grace, maybe you can explain it to me. When influencers like, I'll see this happen on trips. They'll go on a trip with yeah. a brand and half the, you know, they'll tag the brand in the post that they were contracted for. Yeah. And they'll do other posts and not tag the brand. Or like they'll do a sponsored post for a brand and then they'll do an organic post it's no one sponsored yeah. and they won't tag the, and the brands in it but they won't tag them and I, I don't understand they, why like if some influencers feel like I'm not giving anything away so if you didn't pay for it you don't get a tag the only thing I can think of is that they think that their readers or followers are going to think it's another sponsored post and so then it's like it looks like you're doing all this sponsored content so I think maybe yeah. maybe that's it but I, I don't do that like I tag everyone whenever sometimes right. I forget like but I mean obviously I'm not an influencer and like I try and tag brands just because I don't want to answer fucking stupid questions about same what, I don't like, want I, everything I do is, is to cut down on DMs <laughs> yeah like of course yeah. they still probably DM you yeah. and like where are the sunglasses from you like tap the photo people I tell my size the brand like way too much information I cringe writing it but it's just to cut down on the DMs right um so then two months after a post what are you doing to stay in touch with that brand? Probably not enough. Um, I'm not great at pitching myself and I'm not great at recontacting people. I have a friend who has every brand she works with in Salesforce and then reaches out using that. I have a newsletter for brands where I talk about what is going on. Yeah. But Whose I idea was that? All right. I haven't sent it out in a few months. Maybe I'll send one out this you week. Should. You should. But you, I remember yeah. you emailed me. Didn't you say that like, you sent it out and it, yeah, it and was working? Yeah, and I got working. some work yeah. from it. Yeah. Um, so that's a great way. I would say that it, the big thing is like to keep using it because then the brands, then you tag them, they DM you and they're like, we love that. Like, yeah. oh, we want to send you something else or we want to get you for another sponsored post. And like, that's great. I don't yeah. know. I so should be better. I should be better about pitching myself and I should be better at staying in touch with brands after yeah. the fact. I mean, I think that like for all... You, you know, I think that the interesting thing, like tagging them on Instagram, they usually get like yeah. reminded you exist. Like it, it can be simple. Like if, again, if someone paid you, just put it into an Excel doc, a Google yeah. doc, um, and, and maybe just like put the date that you posted about the brand. Yeah. And, and then in like three months, if you see, oh, I haven't posted about them. Yeah. Post something, go buy something of theirs, like do something and tag yeah. them and like it will probably it goes a long way. It's like yeah. buying a $20 product and posting about it. Yeah. Like I always goes, try and shop with the brands that, yeah. that pay me. It goes a long yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and Sometimes I get yelled at. Like Sarah Flint did a shoe sponsorship with me. And then I like, I mean, I love her pumps are my favorite, yeah. my favorite heels. I went and bought two pairs, two more pairs and they yelled at me. They're like, we would have given you those. I was like, I know, but like, I also want to be able to tell my readers, like I bought, I bought these because yeah. I love them. Right, you like you gotta get high in your own supply, right? <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So, obviously, a, a big focus for most people, the, probably the two biggest is like, how much money am I making and how much am I growing? Of course. Um, and you are uniquely positioned for an influencer, I think, in being kind of more diversified than most yeah. in their in their platforms and and then revenue streams. Something we didn't even talk about, and I don't know if we have time to, but like you also have an incredibly active private. Facebook group. Oh yeah, I do. It's only three thousand people, but they are—they're the best. Yeah, I love them. That's uh, how I think that's how I got Sephora Squad because I posted about it there, and I. And she I, got like a crazy amount of testimonials. Speaking for about following. crying, I was reading because they were all like pasting in their testimonials. I was like sitting at my desk sobbing. That's great. <laughs> it was so nice. Yeah, that is yeah. nice. That's it's. I mean, I think it can be a. Uh, it's such a. It's such a. Wait, did I tell you the story? I think it's actually, I know we're running over, but the story of how I started the Facebook group is actually kind of funny. Are we okay? Oh, totally. Okay. Yeah, there's, so there's no what, the time limit. I sent, so I did this post a while back about dating and how it's so hard and 
blah, blah, blah. And one of the things I said was like, get yourself a good group of friends. And I had so many messages, emails, DMs saying, Grace, it's so hard to make friends in your 30s, like I, or, or your 20s, just like living in a big city. And so I said, oh, I'm gonna help you all make friends. I'm, so I, I was like, I'm gonna create friend groups in every city. So send me an email if you want me to connect you. And so I did, and I got over 500 emails in like wow. two days. I was like, fuck, like, what have I done here? Yeah. I was on a press trip in Miami at the time, and I was just like, oh boy, like these are really like flooding in. So I did yeah. it, and I set it up, and then I was getting, people were messaging me and saying, oh, I wanna be added to the Boston friend group, I wanna be added to the yeah. New York friend group. And like, I had just passed on the emails already to, like, I, right. and so I was like, ugh. So I started the Facebook group because of that. And that is, and now like there's all these meetups and things, and like it's not about me, like it's about yeah. the community. They're they're meeting up, they have book clubs, and you know they give each other travel advice, and Amazing. they they meet up. Like I went to, I crashed one of the dinners because there was a dinner <laughs> in the West Village, and they were just like these. It was like 15 really nice girls, like, and they were like people have said to me, it's fucking I, crazy that 15 year blog readers have yeah. dinner in the West Village together. So I, I met them, and they're like, <laughs> one of them messaged me, and she's like, I met your be my best friend in the city, this because this was like two years ago mm -hmm. that I started this. I met my best friend because of you. And that adds, that makes me feel so much better because I feel like as an influencer or something, like what's like the bigger purpose of what we're, we're doing? Like yeah. what are we accomplishing? And like knowing like, yes, I'm helping people like with their skin, like, you know, it's always nice to look younger or have like beautiful shoes. But to know that I help people make like what are hopefully lifelong friends, like that's where I'm like, oh, I love what I do. Yeah. I don't know what the, the the, the number or stat is, there's something that's either 10, maybe it's 10,000. I think someone said that if you can have 10,000 dedicated fans yeah. of something, a product, something you do, that like you will be successful. That like 10,000 people being really into what you're doing can completely change your life. Yeah, um, I think you're And right. I think that like too many influencers are you know, quantity, not quality focused, I think. And I think what's so nice about this conversation is hearing about the care you're putting into not getting a new follower, but trying to keep the one you have happy. Yes. We've talked about this at lunch. Yeah. We go to lunch every now and then. It's really we nice. Uh, we talked about that. Yeah. And I think it's it's rare. And I think that like, it's, it's somewhat a product of our culture of just like, once you get something, the, the only thing you care about is the next thing. Instead of being like, look, if you have 10,000 followers, that's 10,000 people following you, like, and, and you're so focused on growth, but like, have you asked yourself recently, like, what am I doing for these people? Yes. That have already followed me. That's the thing, like, I have 111,000, and I'm so busy just trying to engage with them and, you know, keep, like, reply to their comments yeah. and their DMs, like, I don't know that I want that many more. <laughs> um, I mean, if I get more, great. Like, right. I'll figure it out. But I always want to be the person they're talking to, and I will always want to have that relationship with them. And, like, if I get a reader email, I put it, and maybe I shouldn't do this, I put that, I prioritize that over a brand email. Yeah. And I'm still pretty I, good on email. I think, that, I think that that will probably, in the long run, be a great thing for you. And, and yeah. well, yeah. I mean, that's, that seems as good as any note to end on. I think I have one final question for you, which is, how do you feel about season eight of Game of Thrones? Oh my God! <laughs> what are they doing? You're not a fan, I assume. I'm upset by the last episode. They like spent seven, seven and a half seasons building Daenerys into this amazing person, and they just like crucified her last week. And so this is gonna is this gonna go up this Monday? Yeah. So the finale will have been last last night, and right. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm upset. Yeah. Well. You know. And I'm also upset because I, my cat is named Tyrion after right. Tyrion Lannister. He's great. They're not going to fuck with him. They can't. Everyone, no. is, everyone on Twitter says that Tyrion's going to die. No, I hope not. I thank you for coming. This was fantastic. I think you're our first tequila and LaCroix drinker on the show. So, yeah. It's all about um, the tequila. And, uh, and I'm going to go to Crystal's event and be all tipsy for it. There we go. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was fantastic. If you guys don't follow Grace, follow me. I'm sure you do now. If you I don't want it. any if more followers, here, but I want all of you. Yeah, go to her blog every day. <laughs> don't follow her. And listen to my podcast. And listen to that her podcast. That on paper. That on paper. 
Um, yeah. And we'll see what happens on Sunday. Yeah, I'm, I'm terrified. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so honored to be here. I listen. I never miss an episode of your videos. Thank you. Ever. Thank you. It's the best. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Empty glasses. Yeah, I have a little bit. Yeah.